Come here a moment. Look. That wasn't there this morning, was it? No. The Andersons took their antenna with them when they moved. It's a star of luck. What? Ham radio operators. You know what they do to radio and television reception. Buy U.S. savings bonds regularly. Help keep your country strong while your savings grow and grow and grow. Hello, Marta. La, la, la. Hello, Fada. La, la, la. Here's a game called La, la, la. Camp Granada. La, la, la. Eat and eggs. And Ralph thinks of George right away, because he's the huskiest and the strongest boy in class. Meat and eggs help the body grow and make it strong. Meat is good for you, and there are many kinds. There's beef, there's pork and ham, there's lamb, fish is good, and so is chicken and other poultry. Here's the answer. The world's most automatic refrigerator, the wonderful Westinghouse Frost Free. It never needs defrosting, and it's $50 less than any of the so-called automatic refrigerators on the market today. And remember that Frost Free means no defrosting anywhere, not here in the food storage section or up here in the freezer. Look for this famous magic button. It's the sign of the exclusive Frost Free system. And remember, you never touch that button. With the Westinghouse Frost Free, the defrost water evaporates automatically. You have nothing to do and nothing to touch. And just look at all the other wonderful features you get in a Westinghouse Frost Free. A real big freezer. And then down here, there's a humid drawer that keeps your green things garden fresh for days. And over here, these sturdy shelves in the door that keep things in such easy reach. Let me remind you once more that the Westinghouse Frost Free is the only fully automatic refrigerator on the market. And it's $50 less than any self-defrosting refrigerator made today. See this and the other Frost Free models at your Westinghouse dealer. You won't find any other refrigerators like them anywhere. And remember, you can be sure if it's Westinghouse. On the evening of June 23, 1965, Houston PD officers Captain Charles Bullock and L. Mark Barta were dispatched to a welfare check on an elderly couple at 1815 Driscoll Street at the request of Marvin Martin, a nephew of the residence. Fred Rogers, age 81, and Edwina Rogers, age 79, had gone missing. After several failed communication attempts, Marvin alerted the police. Upon arrival, officers attempted to enter the front without success. This led them to check the back, where they discovered several heavy flower pots were stacked upon each other, blocking the door. Officers pushed and wedged the way inside and instantly felt an eerie feeling. It just didn't feel right, Bullock said. As Bardo searched the rest of the house, Bullock headed for the kitchen. The table had been set, but dishes and silverware were stirring about. The place was a mess. He opened the icebox where he found several stacks of washed, butchered meat. Hog meat? He wondered. What a waste. As he closed the door, he felt a strange sensation, as if he were being watched. He froze in the warm icebox light, glancing down at the vegetable bins, peering through a pair of lifeless human eyes that glared back into him. Bullet quickly slammed the door. He doubled over and became ill. He gathered himself. 
reopened the rancid icebox and discovered the heads of Fred and Edwino Rogers. Fred's eyes had been gouged out. Upon this gruesome discovery, Barta and Bullock sprinted out of the house to call for backup. Investigators searched the premises, finding that most of the evidence had already been cleaned. Blood remained in the upstairs bathroom, where the bodies had been dismembered. From the cleanliness of the cuts, Bullock assumed that the sections had been performed by someone with a knowledge of anatomy. They found traces of blood leading into the attic, which had been converted into a bedroom for Charles Rogers, Fred and Edwina's 43-year-old son. There, they collected a handsaw with slight traces of blood, the likely surgical tool, a couple of ham radials, clothing, a kettle, a large knife, dishes, and a hot plate for cooking. These items and the remains were taken into custody and studied in their lab. Autopsy reports indicated the murders occurred on Father's Day, 72 hours before they had been discovered. Edwina died from a headshot wound, but the weapon was never located. Fred had been beaten to death with a claw hammer, his eyes plucked out, and genitals mutilated. The hammer was later found, wiped clean of any fingerprints. Some internal organs had been flushed down the toilet and were recovered from the sewer. Only Fred and Edwina's intestines, heads, legs, and torsos were accounted for, while the rest of the limbs remained missing. Authorities began a nationwide search for Charles, who was labeled the prime suspect, but was nowhere to be found. Detectives called on anyone who knew the family. They drove into Charles's history to uncover the secret of who he was and where he might be. In 1942, Charles began studies at Texas A.A.M. University, later dropping out to enroll in the University of Houston, where he earned a Bachelor of Science in Nuclear Physics. During World War II, he served as a pilot for the U.S. Navy and in the Office of Naval Intelligence. Rogers was intelligent. He spoke seven different languages fluently, and he had in-depth knowledge of ham radios. For nine years, he worked as a seismologist for Shell Oil Company, determining drill locations relative to gas, oil, and gold. But in 1957, he quit his job without explanation and became a recluse. He bought the house at Driscoll Street, allowed his parents to move in, and lived there, unemployed until his disappearance in 1965. Rogers was described as strange. His only method of communication with his parents came by passing notes under his door. His cousin claimed that Charles would often leave his house at the crack of dawn and return well after dark, attending to some unknown business. That cousin, the same one who had asked the police to perform a welfare check, was the only person outside Fred and Edwina who knew that Charles was living in the house. The family maid later said in an interview that Edwina confessed she had not seen her son in more than five years. There are numerous reports that Roger suffered an abusive childhood which carried on through his adult life. Fred allegedly sexually and physically assaulted his own son. His parents manipulated him, abusing his checking account and taking out bank loans in his name. After the murder of Fred and Edwina and their son's disappearance, a judge declared Charles dead in 1975 to probate the Rogers estate. The house was demolished. Many have since weighed in on the mystery scheming endless theories examining why or if Charles murdered his parents. The first theory comes from John R. Craig and Philip A. Rogers, no relation to Charles, who released a book titled The Man on the Grassy Knoll in 1992, suggesting that Charles was a CIA agent involved in the assassination of President Kennedy. They surmised that his mother may have discovered the truth through handwritten diary entries which prompted their murders in exchange for their absolute silence. No diary was ever found, though the idea stems from Charles's association with David Ferrari during his time as a pilot in the military. Ferrari is an alleged conspirator in the assassination of John F. Kennedy. According to the book, 
Rogers was contacted by the CIA to pass information back and forth between Latin America and Langley, using his cover as an oil man for the shale company. John R. Craig stated in the Victoria Advocate, At that time, it was common for agents to work for oil companies because it was a perfect cover. He was probably the best communications expert the CIA ever had. In the attic above his room, he had an antenna that was overlooked by police. He was using the radio to communicate with other agents. By 1957, following his resignation from Shell, Rogers worked for the CIA full-time. He had gained a powerful network of friends. After murdering his parents, he drifted away and continued to work for the CIA until the mid-1980s. The book further theorizes that Charles was tasked to impersonate Lee Harvey Oswald, a patsy in Mexico City just weeks after the assassination. Oswald, along with Rogers and Ferrari, was a member of the Civil Air Patrol in New Orleans. The man on the grassy knoll argues Charles Rogers and David Ferrari were the two gunmen who shot President Kennedy from the infamous grassy knoll on November 22, 1963. However, many believe the book to be fiction. Why would such an elite CIA agent live as a hermit inside his attic? Why commit such violent and gory murders, dismembering and storing his parents' bodies inside his own icebox? During the Cold War, many unsolved mysteries were blamed on the CIA or KGB. Our second theory comes from forensic accountants Hugh and Martha Gardiner, who released a novel titled The Icebox Murders in 2003, presenting that Charles was the victim of abuse and manipulation and therefore murdered his parents as an act of revenge. Fred and Edwina Rogers were con artists against their own son. They would take out loans in Charles' name, empty his savings account, and forge his signature on checks or other documents. Fred was also into fraudulent activities and illegal gambling on Charles' dime. According to their book, when Rogers finally committed the long-planned murder, he fled to Mexico, doing so with the aid of powerful friends he had met over the radio or possibly during documented contract workings with the CIA while at Shell. Rogers eventually made his way to Honduras, where they claimed an unnamed informant had seen him being killed with a pickaxe by miners over a wage dispute. The book also discredits John R. Craig and Philip A. Rogers' theory on Charles' involvement with the CIA due to the lack of evidence. In turn, the Houston Press later reviewed the Garden Years book as fact-based fiction and supposition. The article states, There are many unnamed characters in the book, various politicians and attorneys as well as the eyewitnesses who said he saw Rogers in Honduras after 1965, leaving it plausible that they used creative licensing to weave a story network together around their theory. Many also believe a third party murdered Fred, Edwina, and Charles. If it was a third party, whatever happened to Charles' remains is open-ended. Did they plant the evidence leading up to the attic to cover their tracks and place the blame on a missing son? Could this have been the act of a serial killer overlooked by the police? There were multiple serial killers active in and around Houston at that time. Or might Charles have killed his parents, changed his identity, disappeared into another addict, and become a serial killer? What if Charles is the man responsible for the death of more than 30 persons who were found throughout the 1970s, buried 26 miles away in League City, at a location known as the Texas Killing Fields? We theorize that Charles did, in fact, murder his parents, but also ended his own life. Remember the weapon used for Edwina's execution? It was never found because he took it to a remote place. Charles lived his whole life exploited by his parents. He bore intense hardship through physical, emotional, sexual, and mental abuse from his father and mother. Fred's genitals were severed and flushed down the toilet, his eyes ripped out, and his head decapitated. This resembles an act of spiteful revenge filled with immense hatred. 
He joined the service, kept himself busy, and avoided his parents. Still, he could not escape their con artist behavior. Being a seismologist, he had extensive geographical knowledge of where he might end his own life without his remains ever being discovered. Martin, is there anything new in the murders from last night? Nothing basically new, Bob, that uh, we didn't have last night. Uh, out at the scene, the men are continuing to work on this case uh, at the scene, and we are beginning to get a little background information uh, concerning the family. Do you know much more than you did last night? Some, Bob. Uh, the laboratory at this time are working on some instruments that they uh, gathered at the house, which uh, is a hammer, a uh, razor, a uh, saw, a uh, few other items that they are checking for blood, hair, bone marrow, and so on and so forth. Do you, you do want to talk to the son? That is correct, Bob. We do know that the boy lived with his parents uh, and as of this minute, we have not been able to locate him, or neither do we know too much about him. Is it possible that these murders committed were committed by the same person, or persons that committed the several parts of killings that we've had lately? It is possible, but not probable. The way or manner in which the Tarso cases, as you call them, and this particular case are very dissimilar in the manner in which they met their death. No matter the reason for their murder, Charles's disappearance was as mysterious as his life inside the attic of 1815 Driscoll Street. In the end, we may never know the fate of Charles or what happened on that terrible Father's Day. But one truth is said. For now, we have to wonder, what if?